infertility treatment options, what you need to know before you see the fertility doctor. Hi friends, my name is Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI, so I'm a fertility doctor. I'm here on YouTube to talk you through your fertility and help you have the family of your dreams. Would love it if you would subscribe to the channel if you wanna support our message here. Today I wanna to talk about fertility treatments. One thing that always surprises me is that people show up in my office and they are surprised by honestly the limited options we have for fertility treatments. And this is just the reality of that this is still a really new field in medicine. Remember that the oldest IVF baby is in her early 40s. So this field is just evolving as we go. Your treatment options are going to depend on your diagnosis, the end. A complete evaluation is always going to be needed before you can get treatment recommendations. I know that may sound common sense, but so often somebody will come in and they will say, I don't want to do this test or that test. I know what's wrong with me. Let's just treat that. But the truth is we need to understand the full picture before we can give you treatment options. When it comes to diagnosing your infertility, what we need to do first is we need to get a good menstrual history, see if you have regular cycles, regular predictable period patterns. That is very suggestive that you ovulate. Now, if your periods are irregular, then we need to understand why are you having irregular periods? Could it be your thyroid or prolactin or PCOS or hypothalamic amenorrhea or stress or chronic anovulation for some other reason? Are your fallopian tubes open? Is your uterus normal? Did you know you can have birth defects of your uterus? You can have blocked fallopian tubes. That sometimes means that physically, you're going to have difficulty with eggs and sperm meeting. How is the sperm? Is there sperm? How does it move? What is its shape? How much is there? That is indication of sperm factors. And then one piece of the puzzle that is helpful in just understanding how long you have to grow your whole family and potentially rates of success with different treatment options is ovarian reserve testing. Ovarian reserve testing is checking how many eggs you have available in a given month. This number decreases when you have less eggs available total. So what happens is every month you have a group of eggs that could grow. Each egg grows inside a small follicle. The brain sends out follicle stimulating hormone or FSH, which works to stimulate a follicle to grow. And that's the one you ovulate and the rest of them die. And the next month, another group comes out. When you have more overall eggs left, you have more eggs available every month. And as you have fewer eggs left, there's fewer eggs every month. You can check your ovarian reserve by ultrasound, counting these small follicles or a blood test called AMH. So when you do this testing on people, you will find out that you will have ovulation issues about 30% of the time. You'll have tubal factor or uterine factor about 15 to 20% of the time, sperm factors about 30% of the time, and then the rest is going to be unexplained infertility. And what that means is that there's not a clear reason why you're not getting pregnant. Your diagnosis is hugely going to depend on what your treatment options are. So I'm gonna break down all the options we have and then what we may or may not do in a certain circumstance. The other thing that could determine what your treatment option is, is how many kids you want and what your family planning goals are. And I always think that is a more modern way of looking at fertility treatments. I'll tell you, I wasn't trained to ask people about how many children they have, but it just makes sense at this stage when you're given the opportunity to intervene that you make sure you're doing what's best for somebody in the long run because they may make different choices. So when we think about all of our treatment options, number one, we can do surgery. So fertility doctors can do surgery or we work with OBGYNs or minimally invasive surgeons. Surgery can be number one for endometriosis, number two for uterine fibroids, number three for endometrial polyps, Number four, for uterine birth defects like a septum. And number five, we'll say for diagnostic purposes, although that is not recommended for a diagnosis anymore. You used to have surgery on the list of things you had to do before you could be qualified as unexplained infertility. Surgery doesn't benefit everybody. So if you have a strong suspicion of endometriosis, which is either by family history or your symptoms, painful periods, pain with intercourse, GI changes on your period, you might have endometriosis. Endometriosis, if you go and you remove all of the endometrial implants, can result in an improved pregnancy rate because you decrease inflammation, but that is temporary. And sometimes the scarring that's left from endometriosis, you can't always fix anatomy. So endometriosis is like an autoimmune disease where your body reacts to these endometrial implants, but it really causes high levels of inflammation and that inflammation can have lasting damages. Fibroids, not all fibroids need to come out. 
Fibroids can impact implantation if they're on the inside of the uterine cavity. They can have other symptoms like heavy bleeding and they can be painful. And some people need blood transfusions because they're bleeding this so much. So sometimes you need fibroids removed. You can take them out from hysteroscopy inside the uterus with a camera or with abdominal surgery, either laparoscopic or open. Polyps are small projections of endometrial tissue on the inside of the uterus. Those almost always are removed with hysteroscopy, which is a camera through the uterus. And then uterine septums are a birth defect that also should be removed because there's a high incidence of miscarriage if you have a uterine septum. But that is the surgical option. It is pretty limited. If you have big ovarian cysts, we're typically not taking those out because we don't want to decrease the amount of eggs you have at this point unless we are forced to take them out. Or if your OBGYN or somebody else is concerned that they could be cancerous, that's a different circumstance. But a lot of people have cysts that are very benign and we just watch them over time and don't always recommend removing them. Number two, if you do not ovulate or you do not ovulate on a regular predictable interval, we can try to induce ovulation. Depending on why you don't ovulate, we might do different things. Maybe you need medication for prolactin or for your thyroid, but some of the typical agents for ovulation induction can be oral medications like Clomid or Clomiphene or Letrozole or Femara. These two medications work a little bit differently. Clomid binds to receptors in the brain to block estrogen. So your brain senses that there's less estrogen and sends out a natural signal of FSH or follicle stimulating hormone. And that's the hormone that allows you to grow an egg. Fomara works similarly in decreasing estrogen in the periphery. So your brain similarly senses a lower estrogen and sends out more FSH. Both of these require your brain to interpret correctly. So if your brain is the problem, like hypothalamic disease, you may not respond. Or if you have bad PCOS, then your brain may not send out enough FSH to overcome what is the problem. So these medications are oral, they're relatively low risk, relatively few side effects and pretty easy, but not everybody responds to them. Sometimes it takes time to find the right dose. And I do not recommend using them unless you've done the full evaluation because I've certainly had people who do not ovulate and they go through six months of ovulation induction only to find out there was no sperm in the ejaculate on the semen analysis. And that was money and time that they wasted trying a treatment that was never going to work. Typically, if you are not pregnant after six months of ovulation induction, you have now graduated into unexplained infertility, meaning we have overcome the ovulation issue and you're still not pregnant, something else is going on. Sometimes, in addition to oral medications, we also like to use metformin, which is a medication for insulin resistance. It makes your body more sensitive to insulin, and that actually has been shown to help people ovulate even alone, but specifically in combination with other oral agents. You can also use FSH, which is injectable follicle-stimulating hormone, or a combination of FSH LH, which is brand name known as Menopure. These medications work because they are the similar compounds to they're what the brain releases, just in different doses. So instead of trying to make the brain interpret what is going on and send out an appropriate amount of FSH, this is just giving some FSH. Problem here is that they're expensive, you can over-respond, cycles get canceled more often, and it is sometimes hard to titrate to just that perfect one to two eggs. These are the same medications we use for IVF. So in IVF, we are okay getting multiple eggs. And when you're spending this much money, often that's a preferred option. Current standard of care is not to use those medications and everybody to consider going to IVF if you're not responding to oral agents. Although in some patients, they are appropriate if you can have close, good monitoring and they understand the risks. But that treatment option is ovulation induction. Sometimes we pair ovulation induction with an IUI, an intrauterine insemination, or sometimes we do IUI on its own. IUI is where we take a sperm sample and we put it into the uterus. So I always say we're helping our best players get further down the field. When we do that, what we are doing is trying to help overcome a potential male factor. Severe male factors are not gonna be overcome with IUI, so that's not a great candidate for it. It's great if you're using donor sperm, you might do IUI in a natural cycle where you determine your own ovulation, or if you have two issues, PCOS and you don't ovulate great and a mild sperm abnormality, then ovulation induction plus IUI might be a suitable first step of treatment approach. If you have unexplained infertility, you've got two treatment options, super ovulation plus IUI or IVF. Super ovulation for this circumstance is we do not know what is wrong, but you're ovulating, you're having intercourse, your tubes are open, the sperm is fine, and you're still not getting pregnant. When we do super ovulation IUI, you're taking some combination of the same medications for ovulation induction, but our goal is different. So instead of just trying to get one egg to grow and ovulate like you would have normally, 
we're trying to get like three or four because we're shooting for a higher number. In this circumstance, we need more eggs and more sperm to try to overcome whatever's blocking you from getting pregnant. So the only combination of when we do super ovulation plus IUI is unexplained infertility. It's not very successful for that treatment option. So whereas for other indications for IUI or ovulation induction, you'll have age-related chances of pregnancy, for IUI, it's about 8 to 10 percent for unexplained infertility when you do it with super ovulation. That's better than what natural rates with unexplained are, which are typically 4 to 5 percent if you've been trying to get pregnant for a year, so it doubles it, but it's overall not that successful. Nine out of 10 people are not going to be pregnant from super ovulation IUI with unexplained infertility. Now, the other treatment option that we have is IVF. I have an entire video on IVF step by step, but in general, what we're doing with IVF is we're trying to get one month's group of eggs and take a lot of those gonadotropins, the FSH and LH medication that the brain makes at higher than normal doses to try to get that entire one month's group of eggs to grow forward. From there, those eggs will be taken out of the body in a procedure. Eggs will be fertilized with sperm. Embryos can grow out. Embryos can be transferred, frozen. Genetic testing can be done. IVF can be helpful to save your fertility. So if you're older and you want to have multiple children, you can get pregnant with one now. And your success rate stays the same from these embryos that are frozen now, even if we're transferring them in two, three, four, ten years. The longest an embryo has been frozen and become a baby is now 30 years. So IVF is the indication if you have tubal disease. So if your fallopian tubes are blocked, IVF is the only option you have. If you have severe male factor, if you have recurrent pregnancy loss, IVF can help you. If you're older and you have a lot of genetic abnormalities because that's normal, like age-related infertility, you can find which embryos are normal. If you have unexplained infertility, this is treatment of choice or what you may have to go to if your IUIs do not work. Or if you have PCOS and you're not responding to oral ovulation induction agents, IVF may be the safest option. And pretty much that is it, meaning the treatments I have are pretty limited. I can do surgery on you, I can help you ovulate, we can do an IUI, and we can do IVF. So when you come to the fertility doctor, sometimes patients are really surprised that there's not more that we have to offer. We are really evaluating and we love data. We wanna know everything we can about you so that we can guide you on which treatment or what is the course of action that makes the most sense for you. As always, you can get more information on the As A Woman podcast or you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. Thanks friends.